Make your way to your seats. We'll start momentarily. I'm Major Brandon Palmer from U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, and it's my pleasure to be your MC for this morning's breakfast. As a courtesy to our guest speaker and for our fellow professionals, we request that you silence all communication devices. Questions for our speaker today will be texted to the email address provided on the screen. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance and remain standing for the invocation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This morning's invocation will now be given by Chaplain Stephen Cervantes, Deputy Command Chaplain for U.S. Pacific Air Force. I invite you to pray with me. Almighty God, today I'm reminded of the humble words that King David penned long ago when he said, Bless the Lord who is my rock. He gives me strength for war and skill for battle. He is my loving ally, my fortress, my tower of safety, my deliverer. He stands before me as a shield. I take refuge in him. He subdues the nations under me. Today, I remain grateful for the faithfulness of God as we go into battle and the battlefield provisions available to each of us. In the cyber realm, our adversaries seek to inflict harm upon our nation and our partners and allies here in the Indo-Pacific. We are grateful for the last couple of days we have had together to increase our collaboration as industry and government, seeking to build systems and networks that protect the world order that values the sovereign rights of nations and where goods ideas, and people can flow freely across the land, cyberspace, and the open seas. We seek to ensure that the world's most dynamic region is free from coercion and is accessible to all. And we promote freedom and openness by defending an open, interoperable, secure, and reliable internet against those who actively work to make the internet more closed, more fractured, and less secure. Grant us your wisdom as we continue in these efforts today, and may our relationship strengthen in a way that honors you and promotes liberty and justice for all. I pray these things in your holy name. Amen. Thank you, Chaplain. Everyone, please be seated. On behalf of AFSIA Hawaii and AFSIA International, aloha and welcome to day three of the 36th AFSIA TechNet Asia Pacific Conference. We are fortunate this morning to have in the audience tomorrow's leaders and their cadre who are now part of the junior ROTC programs from across the great state of Hawaii. I would like to take this moment and recognize them. Cadets. If you would please stand this morning and be recognized as I mention your school. Farrington High School. <laughs> Kaiser High School. <laughs> K 
Kaimakee High School. <laughs> Waipahu High School. Hey, Waipahu. Aea High School. Punahou High School. And McKinley High School. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please enjoy your meal. He might read my bio, so I had to make sure that I didn't have to hear about myself. And if you want to know, you can read it somewhere, right? So, hey, thanks, General Lawrence. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. Uh, my first time at uh, AFSI here in Hawaii, so it's uh, I, I greatly appreciate uh, the chance to to spend a little time with industry. Uh, but I also had the opportunity to spend a little time with uh, some of the junior ROTC cadets here in the audience today, and so. What a good juxtaposition, I think, of, of, of where we are in terms of uh, developing the future while trying to use the experience in this room uh, to be better at what we do every day. So, General Lawrence, thanks again for the opportunity. And to those junior ROTC cadets out there, I just want to say thanks, right? I don't know how long you're going to ride in that uniform, but it's an opportunity, like we talked about, uh, to get to know some new friends and have, like, a common bond that you can always you can always turn to. You got a little family there that's always there to support. And in my 30 years in service, you show up and they know that you're part of the US military and you two share a bond and you can immediately get after whatever the problem is because you kind of know each other. So good luck with that and I wish you all the best as you continue your junior ROTC efforts. Hey, so uh, it's not, you know, I'll talk to you about Pacific Air Force's perspective today, uh, but I actually want to go back to the past, not just because the ROTC cadets are here and history uh, is something that, uh, you know, seems so far away, it's probably not worth paying attention to, but I'm going to tell you, uh, as a deputy commander of Pacific Air Force's, history matters. So let's go back to September 18th, 1942, I'm sorry, April 18th, 1942 which is 80 years ago this coming Monday. 80 years ago this coming Monday. It is a seminal event in my view in American history, in Indo-Pacific history, and certainly in my Air Force's history. On that day, a guy named Jimmy Doolittle led the launch of 16 B-25 bombers off the USS Hornet for a mission now widely known as the Doolittle Raid. This mission, in my view, demonstrated U.S. commitment, resolve, and resiliency. Three things that I think are essential moving forward for our nation and our partners in this region. This was a joint event, it was kinetic, and it was an information operation. It was joint, it was kinetic, and it was an information operation. Sounds a whole lot like where we are today. And it was complex. In order to complete the mission, the aircraft needed to carry twice the maximum amount of fuel to cover the 2,400 nautical miles to reach both their targets and ultimately their landing destination. But they also had to be light enough to get airborne in just 467 feet, which is just past the length of a football field. Think about that. In order to do that, um, they had to ditch everything that didn't matter off that airplane. So they had to get, throw away gun turrets, put in lighter false ones, get rid of extra radios, extra equipment. They had to figure out how to put more fuel on and they put it everywhere they could, in crawlways, bomb bays, and, and now in the empty uh, gun turret areas. 
And one of the pilots, a guy named Captain Greening, the, the, the key to the US bomber force in World War II was a thing called the Norden bomb site. It was essential to how we did business and it was an advantage we had over everybody else, but it was too heavy for this mission. So Captain Greening figured out how to make a lighter one and it cost him all of 20 cents. So even if you uh, inflate that for inflation over time, it's not $700 million, I'll tell you that. So, um, and of course the crews had to be trained not only in carrier takeoffs, but also they had to be prepared for crash landing if they didn't make it to their intended landings. The B-25 had not yet been combat tested. We flew airplanes without testing it. Hmm. What a great idea to maybe move a little bit faster when we need to, huh? So no one quite knew how this operation would play out. However, the risk, the high risk was met with high reward, and while the, we can argue about the, minimum, uh, the minimal bomb damage that day, the strategic impl implications were extraordinary. It certainly dominated the information space and strengthened U.S. resolve, but more importantly, it demonstrated the U.S.'s commitment to the Indo-Pacific. It was the first step towards victory and vanquishing both tyranny and a world order that generated two world wars and killed millions of people. It served as the catalyst for the eventual victory that brought forth the rules-based order that Admiral Paparo stressed to you on Monday. But it also showed the exceptional nature of the American service member, one that with a little ingenuity and a lot of guts can garner success. And oh, by the way, this was all done in four months, not four years through some grand JSIDs process, right? When push comes to shove, we need to realize that all that stuff is interesting, but it's not compelling. The Doolittle Raid was a joint multi-domain effort. It was innovative, it was synchronized, and it was conducted over the vast tyranny of distance of the Pacific with the intent to evade identification by enemy surveillance. That sounds a lot like today. Today we need that same innovation, that same creativity that asks why, but in a spirit of why not. So 80 years later, that order that emerged from World War II is under threat. America and its allies and partners are charged to defend it, to deter those that would seek to upend it. That deterrence, that commitment, to ensure aircraft can fly unimpeded in international airspace, that trade can move without restriction, that individuals and nations are free of coercion, requires constant commitment and action. It requires us to evaluate the circumstances and evolve our thinking and our approaches, to strengthen our position and to communicate our resolve. It requires us to look at how we can use current tools in new ways or to find new tools to meet the challenge. So for Pacific Air Forces, I would argue in some ways we're doing just that. Uh, you've heard PACAF talk about Agile Combat Employment or ACE to project combat power through a network of distributed operating forces across the theater enabling at the unit of action level centralized command and control at a hub while multiple decentralized execution sites actually execute. This concept clearly isn't new, but I'm telling you it's new to this force given where we've been for the last 20 years. It harkens back to a strategy our predecessors used in World War II, as well as how current logistics chains uh, move uh, goods across the world today. This is how we project combat a credible combat force in a modern contested environment. Recent exercises, including many with our region allies and partners, allowed us to test these tactics, techniques and procedures in support of ACE. During one of these exercises a few months ago, we executed hundreds of sorties across five islands and seven airfields, demonstrating operational unpredictability, aggregating combat power, and assured command and control rapidly and effectively employing fourth and fifth gen combat power in theater. Forward commanders at the spoke sent data to commanders at Echelon where those leaders could make informed decisions and in turn provide guidance back to the leading edge. Data moved between nodes. 
This was a solid step towards our vision of information aggregation, and we continue to refine and advance our systems to make the processes faster, more resilient, so tightening the decision-making cycle. In the months and years ahead, we will expand and improve to increase interoperability between our joint force as well as our allies and partners. Compressing the decision chain, eliminating barriers, and creating effects within a relevant time frame. These forces collect, generate, and need data and resilient pathways to maneuver it. Admiral Paparo talked about decision superiority and maximizing communication and information sharing to outmaneuver our adversary. General Clearfield discussed the critical ability to sense, make sense, and act. Every U.S. military service and every partner nation understands that the foundation of their systems and their decisions' effectiveness is data. And, and it needs to be available at the speed of relevance. Our Air Force and our sister services are already investing in technology that integrates and shares information and data across platforms, services, and nations. This is what we call the Joint All-Domain Command and Control Strategy, and it's necessary to maintain the strategic advantage today and in the future. It's also known as JADC2 for the military and its penchant for algorithms. This strategy recognizes and emphasizes the need to connect, communicate, and integrate. And it seeks to synchronize our collective efforts across all domains, land, sea, air, space, and cyberspace. The goal is simple. The process may be a little bit harder, but the goal is simple. To get the right information to the right decision makers so we can create the right effects. Data integrity and speed matter. The source shouldn't. We must and we will be platform, service, country, and in my opinion, open source and all domain agnostic. Find the data, move the data, get the data to the person that needs to make the decision, ensure the data's integrity, and outmaneuver the enemy in all domains. So where do we need help? That's not an easy problem set. We're making headway, but where do we need help? And this might not be what you want to hear, but this is kind of my, my personal view on this. We need help keeping up with you. And what do I mean by that? When I joined the service 30 years ago, the equipment we had, we were a hardware company then. We're a software company now. Think about that. We were a hardware company then and we're a software company now, was forged by government-driven research and development, without a doubt. In fact, the world was. Prior to 1991, government R&D had been world-driving. Since 90, 1991, commercial and private sector R&D sets the pace. Technology is outpacing our DOD acquisition processes and ultimately outpacing the systems we have. We, the U.S. government, are still funding R&D and even increase it in this year's budget. There are indeed some exquisite capabilities that, need, uh, that are needed and are inherently uh, national government level activities. But my contention is it isn't everything. There are things that we need to do R&D on, and there's things that I think that the, the, the civil sector uh, is doing quite well and doing for us. It, those things are available now from the civil sector, and they're close enough to fill the need, and in my opinion, that should be good enough. Our R&D is dwarfed by the commercial sector in both dollars and in speed and in results. When I look out, and this is cool if I'm a junior ROTC cadet thinking about trying to join a service. It's as cool as it gets right now. I see fully autonomous vehicles and flying drones, swarms of drones, automated warehouse robots, nano medical technology, micro satellites, reusable rockets, and self-taught AI. The pace is literally relentless. And it is as cool as it gets if you're on the outside trying to evolve society, but if you're charged with defending the nation, 
it's a little bit disconcerting. It's disrupting, right? The opportunities, in my view, are argu arguably limitless. And I think today we are at an inflection point that should remind us of the late 1880s through the 1930s. The pace of technology in that era was extraordinary. It disrupted the world and it disrupted the nature of warfare. And it caught militaries by surprise. If you didn't stay up and connected and aware, you were left behind and your nation suffered before it. And I remain absolutely convinced we are squarely in that same level of disruption 100 years later. So that's why I need help. The pace of technology is extraordinary. These young men and women get it, right? I call it the curse of the electric toothbrush. And you may say, what the heck is that all about? Anybody here grew up with a manually operated toothbrush? Raise your hand. <laughs> all right? When you first got your electric toothbrush, what did you do with it? You used it the exact same way you use your manual toothbrush. You may not remember it, but you did. And it probably took a while for you to look at that technology different and change the way you behave. These young men and women in this room do not see the manual toothbrush. They see a device that can do just about anything, and we just need to figure out how to use it in a way that makes us more effective and makes our nation safer. That's the challenge before us today as senior leaders, and it's the advantage and opportunity the young men and women have sitting in this room. So the question for those in uniform is how to stay aware and find solutions that don't require a 10-year development cycle. And it's organizations like AFSIA and the industry in here that are the way to, to come together and have those discussions, see things on the floor, and understand where we are. That's critical to in my mind and running a process that leaves Moore's Law looking at us and laughing when something finally shows up 10 years later. So here's my simple example. There's a commercial company that developed drones that three years ago were delivering medical supplies to austere hospitals. When the, when the austere location needs something, it sends a text to the hub, the hub loads it up, the drone flies to the designated point. The drone texts the receiver that it's inbound, and when its drop time is, it drops the package and returns to the hub. We well, didn't do that. I didn't figure out that R&D. Somebody had a need out in the civil sector, and civil sector R&D figured that out, using the great technology that's there, and they merged it together. But holy smokes, let's think about that for a second. Didn't I just talk about hubs and spokes? That technology might be good enough to deliver key supplies between hubs and spokes in my business. Do I need to spend time doing a 10-year problem to figure that out? No. I just need to know it's there, figure out how to get it in the hands of airmen that can put it to good use. And yes, I said airmen, but it's soldiers, sailors, marines, guardians, any one of them needs that tech. So there are many creative solutions out there in the market. We don't need to necessarily have to create so much as we need to integrate it. Uh, we need to get this tech into the hands of our service members and let them do what Jimmy Doolittle's team showed you we can do, which is innovate and be creative. So to finish, I kind of have one more thought. Jimmy Doolittle's Raiders didn't just load their bombers onto and jump aboard the USS Hornet in Alameda and sail and fly their way into history. They spent weeks preparing in northern Florida. The crews practice intensive carrier takeoffs, cross-country flying, night flying, navigation, as well as low-altitude approaches to bombing targets, rapid bombing, and evasive action. They needed to train with their new tools to increase their chance of success, and then to modify techniques to survive against threats. Realistic training mattered to Jimmy Doolittle, and I'm going to tell you it's critical to us today. Today's systems and weapons have expanded in some cases well beyond the physical ranges we have around the world, whether they be in Alaska, in the mainland, uh, or elsewhere. This is driving us to a virtual training environment. These kids call it video games. 
they get it, right? And me, anybody wearing a uniform under the age of 20 do video gaming, raise your hand. Come on, raise it. Your teachers aren't here, right? <laughs> they get it. I still have people in my service that believe the only way that you can train an airman to be ready for combat is to go to Nellis. And I'm not saying that we don't need Nellis, but I'm saying that there's an environment out there that's much more realistic and it's much more lethal, and that's what matters. The density of threats that we're gonna face requires a virtual system to display those so that our Soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, guardians can practice in an environment that's much more challenging than the one they're going to face. We did that previously in live training. And a Desert Storm and Allied Force show that when you can give an airman 10 sets and reps in a really complex environment, when they go into real world combat, they actually come back saying, wow, that was easier than I thought it was going to be. That's the advantage that the US military has had, and that's the advantage we have to restore via the virtual environment. I don't need $100 million simulators. These kids are putting phones in front of their eyes, and they're doing virtual and augmented reality to create an environment that's realistic. Replicate the threat, Good enough is good enough and allow me to give those, those service members the opportunity to fly through that problem, to drive through that problem, to sail through that problem and work together. And that's the advantage that's gonna make the American service member ready for whatever the nation asks of it. It's a central step in maintaining a credible deterrent. It's presenting a combat ready, trained force. So, in closing, in five days, on Monday, April 18th, the Greater Fort Walton Beach, Florida area will host the final goblet ceremony for those 80 intrepid Doolittle Raiders. And you say, why Florida? Because that's where they trained. Fort Walton Beach has embraced the Raiders and they're gonna bring them home one last time. They're gonna say thanks and mark the 80th anniversary of their convention defying mission. With the passing of the last Raider, Jimmy Doolittle's co-pilot, Lieutenant Colonel Dick Cole recently, this ceremony will be the last one and will be held without a Raider. But perhaps they will soon fly alongside their namesake, the B-21 Raider. As we grateful people bid farewell to those daring airmen, we will remember them best by looking into the future. How do we make the absolute most of what we have? What can we do differently? What can we integrate from others to make us better? All in the name of deterrence and to support a free and open Indo-Pacific. Look, moving forward, here's what I can guarantee you. We're probably not gonna launch a B-21 from the USS Gerald Ford anytime soon. But here's what we will do. We're probably gonna launch a B-21 and we're gonna queue it with data from a Navy sensor across an Army network. And it's gonna be escorted by allies and partners and perhaps even command and controlled from an uh, allied and partner aircraft. And it's gonna be its chances of survival are gonna be improved through cyberspace and actors. That's the world we're moving to. That's the world these young men and women are gonna lead in. An aggressively trained, data connected and integrated combined and joint force, and combined means allies and partners, for deterrence for any competitor who seeks to tip the balance of this rules-based international order. That's the challenge that lies before us. That's the opportunity that sits before these young men and women having breakfast with us today. And so with that, I thank you for the opportunity to speak today and I'm happy to answer uh, any questions you may have.
Thank you, sir. We've received a few questions over email. First one, what service is best for the cadets in the room to choose for their career? <laughs> and in which STEM field? I think I got this one, Tony. So uh, I'm, I'm gonna tell you there's no one good service and that's not because I'm trying to be service agnostic and joint. I just need you to serve in a way that makes sense for you, right? The challenges before us are exceptional. So grab a friend, grab a uniform, grab a service, uh, and get on with making us a better country. So uh, in which STEM field? Hey, it, uh, so am I partial to this blue uniform? You're absolutely right. But I just spent last week with a host of three stars from all services and two countries. We walk side by side into the complex deterrence scenario I just created with you. And if we don't, and we don't do it together, the nation doesn't win. So we all have our part to play, and I want you to grab the part that means the most to you. Go Air Force. All right. <laughs> it's cool. Thank you. No, Next no, time. I got to answer the STEM question. So here's what I'll tell you, right? If you're going to be an engineer in the United States Air Force, in the United States Navy, in the United States Marine Corps, in the United States Army, in the U.S. Space Force, um, find a discipline that you like and your service that you choose will put you to good use. But we need STEM folks. I was just talking to a group of cadets about data science, right? I talked to you today about data. I, I need you to understand the tech side of the business so when you're sitting across from your business partners and the folks that are leading civilian R&D that you can have a, have a good conversation with them. Pick a STEM degree and get on with it, right? If you're a knuckle dragon aviator like me, they don't care what your degree is. I'm gonna teach you how to fly and I'm gonna teach you how to lead and um, the degree's important, uh, but it's not as important as the training I'm gonna give you to make you successful. But STEM matters. It's the bottom line. It's the underpinning of this nation moving forward. So um, pick one, do well with it, and put it to good use wherever you choose to serve. Next question. Thank you. What uh, PACF weapons systems and forces may be being provided to USAFE for their Ukraine op support? Hey, so our, uh, you, for those that don't know, uh, it's not USAFE, it's, uh, it's the United States Air Forces in Europe. So um, this is a whole of government approach to support the, the rules-based order that, uh, that I mentioned and Admiral Paparo mentioned that the President of the United States has mentioned, right? Uh, it isn't, there is no PACAF, there is no PAC fleet, there is no Indo-PACOM. There's an international coalition using whatever resources it can find to demonstrate to those that don't believe that the last 80 years have brought the entire world out of poverty and kept us from coming to blows and killing tens of millions of people. So whatever is required to do that and demonstrate that resolve, that's what the U.S. government is doing and every element within it. We're committed to this theater, but we're also committed to, to retaining the international rules-based order regardless of where it's under threat. Uh, so today it may be Europe, tomorrow it may be the Indo-Pacific, and together as a nation and as a set of allies and partners, it's the responsibility of all of us to pitch in what we have to retain the way of life that we've grown up in. So that's kind of all I got to say about that. Next question. What is PACF doing to ensure that new capabilities are allied by design for active interoperability? All right, which, which, that's a good question. I'm just trying to, I, I actually read to see who's actually writing the question, right? Yeah. So, um, hey, so it's not just PACF, right? So. Um, you know, our service and every service, and I talked to you about it today, um, we're, we're in constant discussions, we're in training, we're in exercises with our 
allies and partners in this theater. I just talked to you about one a few months ago where we had multiple allies and partners integrating. We're in uh, flying missions, sailing on seas, uh, integrating at uh, the ground component level to understand where we already are interoperable and where there are some challenges because of either the way systems are designed or the way we look at data or how the contracts are written and whether things are proprietary so that we can go back to the home office in Washington, D.C. and give them feedback to knock down those issues for us. Sometimes it's just policy, right? I'm gonna tell you that policy gets in the way of being great with our allies and partners and what I'm telling you is what you're seeing in, uh, in Eastern Europe when the nation needs to, it will bulldoze policy walls to deliver the mission. So what, what are we doing today? I'm at, we're exercising with those partners to strengthen and ensure that the, we can move data and interoperate. And where we can't, we identify those and we send them back to make sure that we can either affect policy or future systems to knock that down. So. Um, if you need more than that, I got a great command headquarters and we can give you some more data beyond that. Next question. What force buildup is happening or will happen at Anderson AFB? Hey, so um, Anderson is part of Joint uh, Region Marianas, right? Which means it's, it's not alone. Uh, it's a key element of the, you know, our strategy of the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy, but it is just one place. I talked to you about the fact that uh, our job is to be distributed, be connected, and aggregate combat power in the air and disaggregate it on the ground. So Anderson is one place. Uh, it will continue to be a place of importance for us, but it certainly can't be the only place. If I line everything up that every service needs and we put it all in a nice row in Anderson, what does that create? I'm not in the business of making it easy for folks. I'm in the business of dem demonstrating a credible combat capability uh, so that deterrence wins the day. And if Anderson's has a role in that, outstanding, but it isn't gonna be the only one, so. Um, the good news is we have some extraordinary partners across uh, that a region of the world and even, uh, even further west, and we're working with them every day. I will tell you that every service, every component within U.S. Indo-PACOM uh, spent the better part of the last two weeks with our allies in the Philippines working together, right? Um, they're an ally, literally. Uh, they're a great partner, and every day we can operate together. I can knock down some of the, the data or policy issues that keep us from being better uh, and maybe show that, uh, you know, hey, we can be anywhere in the world when we need to be to demonstrate U.S. commitment and resolve to the Indo-Pacific. Okay, what's next? This is the last one we've received through email. How do you believe limited MILSATCOM capacity will impact hub and spoke operations at scale, specifically in terms of sharing the resources with the joint force? Hey, if I'm, if I'm living only in a mil, MILSATCOM world, it's not a good world, right? What did Admiral Paparo talk to you about? Low Earth, proliferated low Earth orbit. Did you hear, have you ever heard General Raymond talk? The 23 president's budget? sees that, um, hey, in a different world, in a different era, a few really cool, really expensive, really large satellites was an okay way to, uh, to, to command and control and move data and communicate across the joint force. The world has changed, technology has changed. Is it my job to create the perfect satellite? Or is it our job to figure out how to use the technology that that civilian sector R&D that I talk about is well beyond where we are, right? They've figured out how to launch quick, launch a lot, make it cost affordable, and put it everywhere. I may use that, 
but I'm gonna find every single way I can to move data and to communicate across anything that's there to find resilient pathways to make the joint and allied force successful. So that's interesting, but there's a broader set of compelling uh, options out there and it's, it's our task together to figure out how to use those and integrate those, which is why we have events like this. So thanks, Cheryl Lawrence. Next question. No Thanks, more questions. we just got cool. one more Thanks. in. Will there be a NATO-like organization soon to bring the nations of Indo-PACOM together? I'm sure that's a good question for uh, Admiral Aquilino and uh, Secretary Blinken. Um, but here's what I know, right? There are like-minded nations out there that don't like to be coerced, like freedom of navigation, like free trade, like the way the rules-based uh, order is, and they work together every day. That's a pretty good group. How they choose to go beyond that is for the senior leaders of my nation and their nations to figure out. In the interim, we have a task to do the best we can with the partners that we have uh, so that we present a pretty challenging set of circumstances for anybody who, uh, who sees that that way of life is not the right way of life. So that's kind of all I got to say about that. Anything else? Any questions from the audience? How about a good junior ROTC cadet question? Those are always my favorite. No one brave enough? Kaiser, IAEA, nobody in blue and junior ROTC wants to stand up and uh, Okay. Hey, so it's good. It's a great opportunity to be here. I appreciate. Air Force. What? Why did you call Air Force? Um, hey, so let me tell you a story, right? So there's this, this kid born in Eau Claire, Wisconsin on September 2nd, 1922. His leather bomber jacket is displayed on a wall in my office. He flew B-24s in India during World War II. His last name was Jacobson. That's mine if you can't read my name tag from here. That was my dad. So I, I didn't know my dad when he was an aviator. And I'm going to tell you, they never talk about it. But when they get together, they do. I was telling a story to uh, this little Kaiser group right here. Anybody ever go to the Ala Moana Mall and watch uh, two older gentlemen with black hats on that say U.S. Korea War, or U.S. Vietnam War veteran? Anybody see that? What do you suppose they're talking about? Are... <laughs> what do you suppose they're really reminiscing about? Are, are they talking about the jobs they had after they wore those hats? I don't think they're missing the time they were at war, but it's the bond that I talked about, right? So I had the opportunity at a couple, what we call China, Burma, India Veteran Association reunions where my dad would get together with everybody he flew with. There's a bond there that you just, you just don't understand. And here's a story for you, and this is how stupid you can be as a 13-year-old. And I was a stupid 13-year-old. Do you know who I met? I believe it was 1981. It was around that time frame, so you can do the math. It's 1968 was when I was born, if you can't, if you can't do public math, because you didn't do STEM, right? <laughs> I have a picture of this stupid 13-year-old kid right next to Jimmy Doolittle. And do you think, I knew what the Doolittle raid was, but do you think I had any idea of the significance of that event? No. So I actually regret not getting to know him. So. I joined the Air Force for that string of reasons. Does that make sense? Doesn't matter the service you choose, though. 
I just happen to have a great role model, and he hangs in my office every day. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Lieutenant General Jacobson, thank you so much uh, for your remarks. Thank you for reminding us how critical it is to continue to adapt, be innovative, and, and bring new technology to meet our national security challenges. And thank you for using historical and modern day examples to, to challenge us, to break down those barriers uh, so that we can do that at, at, a, at, a, at the pace that is needed to keep up with current technology. And I want to present you this challenge coin for the 36th TechNet Indo-Pacific Yep, yeah, thanks for the uh, opportunity. Yeah. Uh, and I also, uh, in lieu of a gift today, we are making a, pr a donation on behalf of all of our speakers uh, to the friends of the Windward Wounded Warrior. Uh, so so thank that's you very much. Thank you very much. We appreciate yeah, well your remarks. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Hey, please, uh, we're going to bring our MC back up. Uh, he's going to go over today's schedule uh, and, uh, and make you aware of those events that you will not want to miss today. So we were fortunate enough to have Tactical Sergeant Mike Gresson join us today. He is currently a VP for membership and going to be moving over to VP for our merging leaders. Uh, he was recognized as a distinguished young professional but not able to go to San Diego, so we will be awarding his award this morning. All right, just a couple admin remarks before we get out of here. We encourage you to join the STEM Innovation Showcase where student technology projects will be on display. And please join us for lunch where Major General Gerard, the Chief of Staff for US Indopaycom, will be our guest speaker. At 0945, there's a coalition panel on information sharing challenges with achieving interoperability and also utilize the AFCIA 365 app for the rest of this morning's events lineup. Lastly, I'd like to ask the JROTC students to move to the stairs at the bottom and behind the escalator for the uh, photo opportunity. Thank you. This concludes our breakfast event.